In 2001, I was invited to become the principal of a new high school opening near Boston and instead turned the job down and decided to combine my passion for teaching and learning with my passion for animals. And from that, Catskill Animal Sanctuary was born. Now, I have a wonderful life. There is no greater joy for me than taking a broken being like this little four-pound pig who came um, from the industry, set aside to starve to death or to be bashed against the floor, which is what they do to the runts, um, who now weighs 700 pounds. There is nothing greater than to take this being, broken psychologically, often broken physically, terrified, never known kindness, and to say to that being, you are safe, you are loved, this is your home, you matter. We have taken in over 3,000 now animals from direct rescue, animals from hoarders, animals from industry, escapees from meat markets, animals who are chickens from mailboxes, roosters from dumpsters, just lots and lots of situations you would expect of animal sanctuaries, but also many that you wouldn't. Um, that part of the work is not why I am here right now. I am here right now with a very simple message. We do not have time to figure out whether we want to go vegan. We do not have time to let our taste buds what we put on our tongue bring about the destruction of this beautiful planet. But that is what is happening. It takes 16 to 20 times the amount of natural resources, land, air, water, energy, to feed a meat eater as it does to feed someone who eats fruits and vegetables and grains. So we're going to walk through that a little bit, and I really invite your questions at the end, and don't hold back if you disagree. I get it. I came from, I totally get it. Uh, in fact, I so get it that I don't get grossed out. People, people, I have so many friends who say, oh, I can't stand the smell of meat. I love the smell of meat. I love the smell of tuna on the grill. So what? It's just taste. It's not life. It's not the planet. The planet is in peril. And I am not a drama queen. So let's walk through the three compelling reasons with a focus perhaps on the planet and on the animals. It used to be obviously that we believed that we had to have meat and that we had to have dairy. And now, in fact, there's an organization that many of you know, headed by a vegan doctor, a brilliant pioneer named Neil, Neil Barnard, who heads Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, who is call, calling meat the new tobacco. Meat and dairy are poison. I know this is a strange thing to hear. I know it's a strange thing to hear, but it's true. Laced with antibiotics, laced with growth hormones, filled with E. coli, filled with salmonella. The industry keeps disease outbreaks quiet. In the United States, the USDA, the, the organization that is supposed to protect our food source, cannot legally issue a meat recall. They can only recommend a meat recall. So we've got a situation where we are, the United States is the fattest 
and one of the sickest countries in the industrialized world. We've got things like heart disease and osteoporosis that is made worse by the calcium in dairy, not made better. High blood pressure, many, many forms of cancer, all being formed, all being caused by this stuff that we've been told all our lives we have to have for our health. But as my dad pointed out, in the 50s and 60s, cigarettes were marketed as a healthy food. It, on average, vegetarians and vegans live six years longer to a full decade longer than meat and dairy eaters. And here's this wonderful icon from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine about the relation, the similarities between the consumption of meat and the consumption of tobacco. There's a link between Alzheimer's and um, meat consumption. There's a profound link between Parkinson's disease. There's a giant study that showed men who drank two or more glasses of milk per day had three times the likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease. And yet, for many people in the U.S. and in Canada, big, big, big pockets of dairy in New York and much of Canada, um, there is this belief that somehow this diet is radical. So I know that in our own heads and hearts and habits, there's a lot that we have to undo. This beautiful earth, this beautiful planet. The politicians are talking about building walls to keep the sea from flooding coastal communities. Is there more insanity than that? We're going to keep out the oceans, we're going to build houses on stilts, as opposed to saying, let's look at the root of the problem, let's look at the cause, and two extremely mainstream organizations, the United Nations and World Watch Institute, nobody's going to call them radical organizations, said in very, very uh, highly publicized studies that the, the UN said 18% of our greenhouse gases, which are the primary reason we are cooking the planet, they're trapping, at, uh, uh, it, they're getting trapped in the atmosphere and we're, we're cooking, we're getting hotter and hotter and hotter by the, by the year. They said 18% of that gas is being caused, created by agribusiness. Several years later, World Watch Institute said, no, that was a flawed study. 51% of our greenhouse gases are being caused by our diet. Now, I don't care which is right. I don't care if it's 18 or if it's 50 or if it's somewhere in between. The fact is that it is only us who can undo that. One issue is that, you know, we're talking about all the ways that this, our choice of what we put in our mouths impacts the earth. And one thing is that most of our grain is grown to feed animals. We have millions and millions of people starving all over the world, and we are taking food, giving it to animals, 16 pounds of it, animals who then become one pound of meat. Isn't there something wrong with that? picture. We're talking about water wars. 
It takes 2,400 days. These statistics, you can Google them. I'm sure some of you are familiar with them. They all vary. Different statistics come from different places, different statistics. People use different methodologies. I see this statistic. I also see that it takes 5,000 gallons um, or 4,000 gallons to produce a water of water to produce a pound of meat as opposed to 25 to produce a pound of wheat, 50 to produce a pound of apples. The Amazon, so the vital Amazon, the life force of this planet, so much oxygen in that beautiful uh, area is being taken down every with, uh, to the tune of a football field-sized area every second. These are just a few of the horrifying things that we're reading about. The number one cause of our water pollution, the number one cause of huge dead zones. There is one the size of uh, the state of New Jersey in, right in the Gulf of Mexico, where the pollution from the, from the um, factory farms goes into the river, it goes downstream, it creates an algae bloom that chokes out all of life. The, uh, this is something I only came across recently. The, there is a massive aquifer under the Great Plains state in the U.S., and we are predicting that it's going to be, in the next few decades, it's going to be dry because the beef industry is taking it, and that a five-state region of the United States will be unable to support the human population. Think of a little apple. Think of a little apple as representing the earth. Carve that little apple into quarters. Put three quarters of it aside to represent water because water comprises three quarters of the planet. We only have a quarter left. A quarter of it is too hot. A quarter of it is too cold. A quarter of it is already used up by houses, buildings, infrastructure. You slice and you dice. And if, if there are any teachers here, this is a wonderful activity to do with children. Anybody can understand this. You slice and you dice, and what you're left with is 3% of the planet on which life can survive. We can't keep doing this. The human population is predicted to be 9 billion by 2050, and it takes 16 to 20 times the amount of natural resources, land use, water use, energy use, grain, to feed us as it does to feed a vegan. Well, us meat eaters, most of us. And then there are my friends, the animals. A lot of us typically rule out, I, I certainly did, I certainly ruled out one animal product at a time. I get, it's a big life change. I didn't go vegan. I didn't see a film on Monday and wake up on Tuesday and go vegan. I first eliminated meat, beef, and then chicken, and then fish, and then eggs, and then cheese. And from what I've read, that's a very typical journey for people. So we're going to go quickly through that. These animals, pigs. I'm, and I'm doing this because my, my guess is that there are some of all of us in this audience. There, there are some, some beef eaters in the audience. There are some people who are struggling to be vegan in the audience. Pigs have the intelligence of young children. They are curious. They are strong. They are willful. They are so emotional. We think at Catskill Animal Sanctuary, they laugh. And the reason we think this is because what on earth else is this when a bunch of humans see something funny and in the same instant, the pig goes, <laughs> so you take these animals, so emotional and so 
willful and food-driven and driven to, they love to solve problems, right? They're, they're marvelous, wonderful animals just about, they have the minds of young children and you take them and you put them in an environment in which they cannot turn around. You take the mother pig, as soon as she has her first heat, and put her in a little crate with metal bars, and she can't turn around. She can't really lie down very easily. And it's in a building, and she's breathing in the acrid ammonia from the feces that have fallen through the metal slats below her. And they go mad, is what we have heard from people who see them, and I absolutely believe it because I would go mad, and I don't think they are so very different from us. So there's that mama, mama pig, in a gestation crate, and when she is about to give birth, she gets a few more inches, she gets a few more inches, not out of any concern for her or her babies, but so her babies won't starve to death. She gets a few inches so that she can lie down and safely nurse her babies, but she does not get enough room to touch her children. She can't bend around, as you can see, to touch them. And the babies are taken at a few months their testicles are cut off without any anesthesia. Their holes are put in their ears without any anesthesia. Their tusks are cut off without any anesthesia. And so many die. So many die from the filth and the stress. Okay, that sounds really bad. I'll just eat chicken. I'm just going to eat chicken. They're only chickens. One of the most beautiful animals I have ever met was a little chicken named Polly. I don't have time to tell you about Polly, but Polly changed my life. Chickens are smart. Lots of studies out of England particularly, but lots of studies are saying they are so much brighter than we ever believed them to be. We grow eight, I don't, we don't need to talk about this. We grow eight billion chickens in the U.S. alone. Right, they are given 42 days to live. Now, those slides that we skipped over in the interest of time showed you how we're growing them so many times faster than we did just a few months, just a few years ago, a few decades ago. Because this is capitalism gone wrong, you guys. It is capitalism gone bad. All we care about if we are the industry is money. Chicken is my product. I grow it as quickly as I can in the least amount of space for the least amount of money so I can put more money in my pockets. And, and obviously, I'm... I'm talking about my pockets, right? So that I can put more profit in the hands of the stakeholders, the shareholders. So, so many of these birds, look at that. Imagine the ammonia, right? Their throats are burning, their eyes are burning, their legs give out, 5% of them are dead before the industry comes in to catch them because their little organs cannot take this rate of growth that they are forced to grow. And then, the Humane Slaughter Act in the United States, I don't know what the law is here, but in the hum none, don't have one here either. Humane Humane Slaughter Act, it, wait, go back. Humane Slaughter Act in the United States exempts all birds. So there's no stunning. These birds die when they're fully conscious. They often go to the scalding tank 
because the slaughterhouse worker has to slit, slit 140 throats a minute and the USDA wants him to go faster. Well, then that's really awful. I'll just eat fish. <laughs> Scientists are predicting that there will be no edible fish in the ocean by 2050. If you can fathom, who would have thought that we had the capacity to kill the oceans? We are killing the oceans. Fishing is not the old man out on the end of the dock with his fishing pole. Fishing is monstrous ships the size of tankers, the size of a football field, fishing vessels are. And they drop nets to the end of the no ocean miles and miles and miles and miles long. Shrimp trolling kills everything in its path, right? There are several methods, don't have time to talk about all this, there's several methods of fishing. Um, if there's any question about whether fish feel pain, there's a wonderful scientist called Jonathan Balcom whose next book is going to be on fish. He says, everybody knows they feel pain, everybody who has studied it. Not only do they feel pain, they form friendships, they play, and look at those numbers, one, two, three trillion fish, because we want something to taste good. Is our mouth the only thing that matters on this, on this earth? Is it the only thing that matters on this earth? Because that is how we act. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so look at, there's a, there's a hard to read, but an important book called e Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer that talks a lot about the fishing industry and um, the many, 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 many species who are decimated by fishing. Among them, beautiful loggerhead turtles, whales, tuna. Look at that old turtle. How old is that beautiful turtle? And look at this albatross. Wait, go back one. Oops. Oh, we just lost it. Hang on. So, oh, okay. That sounds really awful. So maybe I'll be vegetarian. I am going to be vegetarian. I am just going to eat eggs and cheese. Don't be a boy. If you're, bo if you're born to the egg layers, the egg industry doesn't need you, doesn't want you, wants to expose of you in the fastest, cheapest way possible. So guess what? You get ground up. You get ground up alive right after you're born. Or gassed, or crushed, or suffocated. They're finding most industries are moving toward the grinding up method because that is quick. The girls um, get stacked, get taken after they are extracted from their eggs. There's not even natural hatching in the industry. They are extracted by machine from their eggs. They are shipped to the warehouse, the warehouses, and their crates, their crates are stacked in rows in the same sort of acrid, filthy environment, right? That's after, by the way, their beaks have been cut off with no anesthesia 
because we do not want to damage the meat. And there's a photo of that little animal. And there is what, that is what we subject them to do. As many as we can stuff into a crate, and then you eat the eggs from that animal? Really? <laughs> eggs are really bad. Eggs are really, really bad. By the way, they're not good for you either. So, I am just gonna be an almost vegan. I'm just gonna eat cheese. Cheese was hard for me to give up. I liked cheese. Tasted really good. I don't think at that point I really thought I needed the fat or the protein. I just think it tasted good and that was for me the very last thing. Cows are such amazing mothers and they cry and cry and cry and cry when their babies are taken away immediately after birth to be sold as Bob Veal. A lot of people don't understand the veal industry and think that veal calves have four to six months to live. Many of them are slaughtered between birth and two weeks old and that that veal is called Bob Veal. Others get an artificial diet, as many here know, an artificial diet that subjects them to scours, and this is their lives, this is what they know for the six months that they are being grown uh, to feed us. Here's a downed cow. Most of the downed animals in the food industry are dairy cows because we have made them grow so, fa so fast using bovine growth hormone so that they produce more milk, so that the companies make more money. Our children are drinking that milk and girls are going into puberty way too young. And these beautiful beasts whom we have enslaved, that's what all of this is. You cannot call it anything else. There's no shred of humanity or kindness or mercy from start to finish, whether you are a cow or a pig or a chicken or a turkey or a fish. On top of it all, I believe that they are no different from us in ways that matter. Now, people are a little taken aback sometimes when I say that. Here's what I mean. We can use gender, age, race, sexual orientation, social class, religion, language, nationality, to separate us, and that's what lots of people have done throughout the, se the centuries. Or we can say, young, older, man, woman, black, white. Yeah, so what? Who are you? Who are you? These. Animals have rich emotional lives. Ten chickens are as individual as ten people. They form friendships. You can hurt a pig's feelings. A chicken can get really mad at a human being. They are whose. They are as individual as we are, and we can continue to see them as other because just like you and I look different, they look different. Or we can say, 
Maybe it's true that they want their lives as much as I want mine. Maybe this kook up here talking, talking is up to something. Maybe it's true that they are as individual and that there's a whole lot going on, more going on here and here than I've ever considered might be true about a chicken or a cow or a fish. This is Rambo. Rambo was the most violent animal we've ever taken in. He spent a year and a half trying to kill us. He, was, um, he was, had spent his whole life confined in an animal hoarder's house. This is Barbie. Barbie was a broiler. Barbie and Rambo were soulmates. He was a free-range animal, very claustrophobic, so for 11 years he roamed the entire farm and slept in a bed of straw at night. He's a, a magnificent teacher. Well, when Barbie came in, Barbie was also free-range and could have chosen, we have 110 acres, lots of space to walk around, lots of other free-range chickens to hang out with, but Barbie befriended Rambo and she would climb on his back and fall asleep, and Rambo's lady, Hannah, was insanely jealous. And this is not a joke, and here is the picture to prove it. I, I had been hearing about Barbie climbing on top of Rambo's back, and I'd never seen it, so when I saw it one day, I ran to get the picture, and to get the camera, and I, and I heard, the barn is about 130 feet long, but I heard this clip, 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 clip. And before I even turned around, I knew that it was Hannah. Hannah came up to them. She looked at them. She looked at me, looked at them, looked at me. Like, what are you going to do here? Are you going to help me or what? And I said, Hannah, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. She pooped. She shook her head, which is what they do when they're really mad. And she stormed outside. There are 20,000 stories like that from sanctuaries, from places whose job it is to help these animals thrive. I hope that if you are not yet vegan, you will walk out of here examining your heart and saying, is taste really more important than, is taste more important than respecting other beings? Is taste more important than giving every being the chance to live and thrive? You could have been a rock, you could have been a piece of algae, you could have been a pig, you could have been a chicken, and you'd have been in trouble because we collectively act as if we are the only ones who matter. Please care about the animals. Please care about the planet. Please go vegan and do everything in your power to bring your friends and your family along with you. Thank you very much.